I think we're ready to reconvene. Welcome back. Um, our panel this afternoon is going to, uh, uh, the first panel is going to focus on the Communities at Care initiative. I'm really uh, pleased to introduce Kevin Haggerty, who's the director of the Social Development Research Group at the University of Washington and assistant pro associate professor there, and has been involved in developing and uh, testing interventions for, for, for many years. So we're delighted Kevin could make it here. Kevin? Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. It's pretty hot. Wasn't that a great lunch? So nice to have that. So what might be useful for you all is in your packets, there's something that looks at the five phases of CTC. And one of the things we'll be asking is at what point these different uh, communities are, at what point of um, work are they in their, the phases and a little bit about their progress through the phases. So it might be helpful just to have this as some background information for you. And it looks like uh, that probably is the, the piece that would be most useful for you. Um, so it's really a delight for me to be here. I'm the director of the uh, Center for Communities at Care at University of Washington. And it's been really my pleasure to be working with the Colorado uh, sites in a behind the scenes way to provide that coaching for the implementation of CTC. And uh, I've been really de delighted to work with both Erin and Allie in this endeavor. And Erin is uh, to be commended for her help in kind of coming up with the questions for this panel. So to get started, we're going to start with question four first, because that's just the way I do things, a little bit uh, random. And just ask um, folks about what phase is your community currently in, and how are you making progress, and what is it like making progress for that next phase? So let's just kind of get, well, what, let's have everyone introduce themselves first as a panel. And then we'll get into that question. So first, just introduce yourself, what community you represent, and then we'll go back and find out where you're from. Okay. Can everybody hear me all right? Okay, very good. So my name is Shelley Brown. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm the project director for the Youth Violence Prevention Center Denver, which um, focuses its efforts in two Denver communities, Mont Bello and Northeast Park Hill. It is grant funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and um, builds off of a previous five years that also used the Communities That Care process in its work. Hi everyone, um, my name is Jenna Finch and I am the CTC coordinator in Lake County. Hi everybody, I'm John Nelson and I'm the Youth Master Plan Manager in Lake County as well. I was the previous Communities That Care coordinator before I hired Jenna. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Marcy Campbell, and I'm with Boulder County Public Health. I am the Communities That Care Facilitator in Lafayette, Colorado. Hello, my name is Jenny Case, and I'm the CTC Facilitator for Pueblo County. All right, so if there are other CTC uh, facilitators or uh, community members of coalitions here, just raise your hand so we can see who's here uh, representing CTC. That's awesome. So this is really incredible work that you all have been doing. So we get to hear about that a little bit from some of the representatives up here. And so thank you for the work you've been doing. So Shelly, do you want to jump off and start with the what phase your communities devil are in? Right. And, uh, and how are they making progress toward the next step? And what kind of the differences are that you've experienced? Sure. So um, before I kind of get into the phases, it's important to note that we are, I mentioned we're um, under a five-year grant. And we have just finished year one of that grant. So we're on the, um, just in the very beginning stages of year two of five years. Um, I like to say to folks when I uh, talk about the work that we're doing that we have an ambitious timeline. Um, if you ask either of my site representatives, they would probably glare at me and say, I've got to do what now? <laughs> but um, our communities, Montbello and Northeast Park Hill, are transitioning from phase three to phase four. So we've been able to do quite a bit of work um, since we started our grant last year. Now, they were doing the work independently, so both uh, communities had the community board, they had their data committees, they had their resource assessment committees, and they, were, they met multiple times over the course of the spring and um, into the summer. We held a joint community action plan training um, at the end of August, which was kind of an interesting and fun thing to do if you've done communities, two communities at once there. In, it involved doing some 
joint work together, and then we separated them, and they kind of went through all their strategies independently. Um, so from that, we are now working on developing our community action plan. Um, and the interesting thing about our, our communities, and I've had to keep coming back to this multiple times, is that, you know, we're grant directed. So we've got a lot to take care of. We've got business to tend to in a certain timeline. But not, I can't expect both communities to be on the exact same page at the same time. And so part of the challenge is honoring that process and knowing that generally we're in the same place, moving from three to four, but have to honor the fact that this is community work and sometimes it takes time and sometimes you have to pause. And so we've experienced that recently with one of our communities saying, you know, we didn't get everything we wanted from that community action plan training, so let's pause and go back to our resource assessment committee and make sure that everyone is on the same page before we move forward. Because if we don't have buy-in from our community ambassadors, then the work will fail. So I think um, just moving from three to four, honoring both places, um, the speed or the, um, or the pause uh, um, is, is important. Yeah, so in Lake County, we're currently in phase three. Um, we just held a community board meeting yesterday and our risk and protective factor assessment work group presented to our community board um, what they prioritized as our risk and protective factors. Our community board then narrowed those down to two risk factors and to one protective factor. Um, and so from there, that gets presented to our key leaders and we have one more step of approval um, for those risk and protective factors to be decided on. And from there, our resource assessment work group begins to meet and starts that gaps analysis. Can you tell us what the risk factors are? So we're actually going to decline that opportunity because we haven't actually told our key leaders yet. So we want to make sure that they're- Since Yesterday. <laughs> yes, we, we just went to the community board yesterday. So we really want to tell you though. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll tell you all like in code. <laughs> and I would just echo what Jenna said. So um, in Lafayette, we are also in phase three. And um, so phase three really has kind of the two, the front half, which is really all of this collecting data and deciding on priorities. Um, and then kind of the back half, which is the resource assessment. And so we've completed that front half um, by really gathering a strong data package. We partnered, um, we contracted with a health planner and we're also collecting data within the community by getting young people involved, doing environmental scans of the community, um, community surveys, um, in addition to collecting other data sources and really spent some time. Um, our group has been wonderful in terms of having the difficult conversations and the dialogue and processing all of this data. So we did that in multi steps and really spent that time also building capacity, thinking about consensus, learning about these environmental strategies that we're going to be doing because our board really incorporates a lot of community members. So we have a lot of parents and a lot of young people on our board, um, as well as people that are invested in working with young people. So um, we just kicked off um, also um, Thursday of last week, we kicked off with our resource assessment work group and um, began that process of learning what is the big picture, what's that product of the resource assessment, and then broke into some groups. So some are gonna be doing a resource assessment of the different programs related to the priorities that we chose as a group, and some are gonna be working on strategies. And so we really are feeling ready to hit the ground running on all of that piece. And have you prioritized your risk? We protection? have prioritized. We have chosen extreme economic deprivation, <clears throat> community laws and norms um, favorable towards drug use, and we also picked the protective factor of family opportunities for pro-social involvement. Thanks. Uh, yes, yeah, so on Pueblo, we are also in phase three, um, developing a community profile. We completed our um, data assessment, essentially, and prioritized uh, two risk and one protective as well. And what the community board ended up going with was um, favorable parental attitudes and involvement in substance use, um, along with academic failure beginning in late elementary school as the risk factors. And then we chose community level opportunities for pro-social involvement as well. Um, Pueblo is really strong in that area, so we're hoping to do even more with that piece. 
Um, so with the data prioritization out of the way, we have moved on to the resource assessment um, workshop and we are completed, we have completed two of the three sessions for that. Um, that is a lot of work, facilitators, heads up. <laughs> it's a very um, interesting process and I'm really looking forward to seeing the results of that. I think we're gonna learn a lot about our community um, and where the gaps are and how we can fill those gaps with CTC implementation. So some lessons that I just learned from you is that it takes time and that communities operate on their own time even when they're pushed. Um, that you have to respect the community process and I really appreciated, Joan, you're saying, well, no, there's a process in the community and we can't divulge that until we do our whole process. So it's important to respect the coalition and what you're doing. That um, strong data packages really do make a difference and youth voice is important to add in and that it's a lot of work. <laughs> so those are some of the things that I heard. And I'm wondering if there were any readiness issues that emerged or surfaced in your community um, and how you've handled these, uh, things that you weren't really expecting. Because um, there was some sense of readiness even at the outset with this process. Are there things that emerged that um, you ended up addressing a little bit after the uh, beginning of the CTC process? Do you, you have? Sure, um, I can start. Um, so let me give a little context before I fully answer your question. I always say I have a lot of words in my mouth. It's just the English um, major in me. But we're, we're in a, a unique position with our work because we had a five-year grant that was funded by the CDC for violence, youth violence prevention. And we used this, the CTC process, but it wasn't CTC plus. Um, and we focused solely in one neighborhood, Montbello. Now that grant focused on individual and family level programming. And part of our sustainability work included us applying for the next round of funding when it became available through the CDC. But it's not an exact duplicate. It is still focused on youth violence prevention, of course, but what they wanted was for us to scale up and expand. So what that means for us is that we move away from the individual and family level programming that we, you know, we, that we all see on the blueprints list. We leaned heavily on that list. What we had to focus on was community prevention strategies and policy level prevention strategies. There's not as much research behind the community level stuff and so there was a lot of kind of work that we had to do on our end in creating our master list, list of strategies to work from. Um, CDPHE weighed in and provided some support for us as we kind of collaborated to see what would make the most sense. Um, but I think, so there was some readiness around, um, so in the expansion we also included our, our originally, an our original comparison neighborhood of Northeast Park Hill. So the readiness came I think in a couple of different ways, but the big thing was shifting our original stakeholders mentality from the individual and family level programming to the community, community level and really helping them to understand what that meant. Um, for example, one community level prevention strategy is community gardens. And I know we've had a lot of talking points around how do you get from planting a carrot to youth violence prevention. <laughs> so, I mean, it's funny. <laughs> and we had to um, have a lot of intense conversations, you know, at the staff level. We had to have some intense conversations at our community board and with the resource assessment committee, but it's honoring the process because we, we need these folks that have been you know, with us from, for years to understand what the shift can look like and why we had to change things up. So um, that's one big readiness issue. I'll, I'll pause there and let it was answer. So, yeah, it looked like you had something to go. Uh, so I would say that in Lake County, our, our folks familiar with Lake County, we're like the Leadville area. So we're fairly different from like more of an urban setting. And I would say that we have been doing substance abuse prevention work for, for a while um, through the CTC process. Um, and now that we're using CTC Plus, one of the things that we sort of realized was that our community has a little bit more readiness in talking about substance abuse and a little less in talking about mental health. So that was an area that I think we hadn't really anticipated, but wasn't super surprising as well. So what we've been doing is we've been looking at some of the different um, social marketing campaigns that are out there. So for example, Let's Talk is one that we've been looking at that's specifically focused around mental health and really looking at, as we're identifying ultimately what our strategies will be, looking at possibly looking at this particular strategy as something that we could be doing in the meantime. So that's one of the things that we've been looking at in terms of increasing that readiness. 
So um, something that, that we noticed um, when we went out and did some key informant interviews really early on in the process was, um, for one, that um, parents really felt like hanging out, doing, you know, trying out these substances. It's just a normal part of the growing up um, process. So it's just a rite of passage, maybe better have them at my house um, so they're safe. And so we really, um, that, um, we found that that was pretty widespread um, feeling amongst parents and, and adults. And so we really felt like that was something that we wanted to address head on. And, um, and some of that we felt as we had discussions and, and thinking about um, what parents and, and family members do and don't know um, was we were thinking about some of the education and some of the ways that adults and all um, adults in the community can be of influence and not simply relying on the parents to do all of the work, but really how do we come alongside and do better support. And so that's just really something that um, you know, I think did contribute a little bit to us thinking about those family opportunities that some, you know, parents don't feel comfortable in talking with their young people about substances, even though they may be concerned about it. And so we're really just wanting to carry that thread with us into our interventions. So, uh, so I think we're pretty lucky in Pueblo. I don't know that we've had a ton of, um, readiness issues to overcome. Pueblo's a great community that uh, has a long history of coming together to tackle problems as they arise. And so that collaborative attitude is already there, which was a huge advantage um, to me in this position. One of the conversations that I've noticed that uh, kind of continues um, is the concept of taking a universal, you know, primary prevention approach. And I think that is a little bit different for some of our community partners. Um, so that's just been a learning curve for some people. Um, I think they're ready and willing. It's just a matter of learning the why and the how. So it seems that there are, <clears throat> even though you had pretty um, ready communities, there are still elements that you have to kind of deal with as you're emerging through the process. And one of the things that struck me when you were talking, um, Shelley, is that, that for the, from carrot to violence, um, what a great opportunity to kind of think about those five elements that Dave talked about earlier, the social development strategy with the opportunity, the skill, the um, recognition, the bonding, the healthy beliefs, and clear standards. And if you think about some of the things that you all were talking about, much of that fits within that early piece of the normative structure of the community and how to be able to build on that. So it's interesting how that, thinking about the fundamental theoretical foundation of CTC is so important. So um, I'm wondering about what logistical challenges you've had to overcome in order to effectively uh, build your coalition to use the CTC plus framework um, and maintain progress. And, Maybe, John, you might just jump sure. in, because you said you were an active coalition already, and then maybe you yeah. could jump in after that, Shelly, and sure. talk about how maybe there's differences between the two different communities yeah. a little bit. Absolutely. And then anything sure. else people want to add. And just so folks know, I, Jenna's only been on the job for a few months, so I'm not trying to keep her from speaking. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, as you said, we, we actually, um, I was really lucky. I stepped into the community, um, that's communities that care coordinator role with an already existing um, a coalition, and we actually had received a year prior um, OBH funding. So we'd actually already started the process of, of this prior to receiving CTC funding, which was, um, so that was a little bit of a challenge, just being at two different places with two different scopes of work. Um, but we've had really great um, success with our coaches. So we have Danielle Tuft, who I believe is here somewhere, who's our coach, but we actually get two coaches for the price of one because Danielle has a coach as well. So Danielle has Daylene Dutton as her coach. So whenever we have our coaching calls, it's actually often the four of us, or at least three of us, they're having this conversation. So we've been able to really benefit. Daylene, as I'm sure you all have seen in the videos, um, did a great job herself at actually facilitating this process. So she's been really helpful at helping us to identify what might be a problem before it even happens, which has been really, really huge for us. So I would say a couple of things. Um, one, just the, the challenge of having the two distinct communities and making sh it under one grant and making sure that you're giving as much attention to both as you need to. Um, we still have to report out on the overall project every year to our CDC project officers and we have these monthly calls and so there's a lot of accountability 
but going back to they might be in different places and they are um, made up of different people. Uh, so, so there's that, just honoring those differences. I would say um, also unique to us is that we have um, amazing site representatives. So wave your hands, folks. <laughs> um, but their time is divided. So they, are, they, they do serve as the CTC facilitators, but we also have um, a data collection effort that's going on. And so they have their hands on the field effort as well. We are in a place where we are moving from, the, you know, building the community profile to the, um, the community action plan. And so there's a lot of work that's happening now and that will happen in the coming months as we really, you know, get entrenched in implementation. Um, so just being able to, to provide balance to the people that are on the project doing the work every day, I think is, um, is needs to be an area of focus. And then lastly, this is minor, but can be major. And we talked about this at our, at multiple trainings. It's simply the internet. This is an internet-based training. And if you are at a rec center where you're holding your community board meetings and it's all concrete, you don't have any reception, you really have to think about what is your backup. <laughs> if uh, your video that you were leaning heavily on for the discussion does not play. Um, we've had that and thankfully our, our folks are well-versed enough to be able to still conduct the, the education and the training that they need to. And you know, and we give homework, some, some pre-work and some, some work in between sessions. But it was, I think early on we had this big training and uh, you know, the rec center, the internet just was not working. I mean, we had our Wi-Fi and it was like, nope, I'm getting five seconds in and I refuse to go any further. So oh, no. that you know, created a little bit of um, hilarity and there you have it. All right, any other logistical issues on, on folks? One of the challenges that we um, have tried to find ways to overcome is just the amount of meetings that CTC requires. You know, you've got your community board and your key leader board, mm -hmm. your executive committee, your work group, um, workshops. There's a lot, and people are very busy, and this is, um, by and large, probably 98% of our board. Um, this is just something in addition to their mm -hmm. regular full-time job mm -hmm. that they need to make time for. Um, and justify that to their employers, how their time is being spent for yeah. CTC. So, so that is an ongoing challenge. Um, and I think one of the ways that we have tried to work around that is to have open conversations around what the best schedule is for the board. Um, so as an example, we opted early on to meet every other month. Um, and if we need to meet more often, we can do that. Um, but just to make sure that retention stays and people stay engaged and it continues to work for their schedules, I think is very important to the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can definitely add to that. You know, we have about 40 people on our community board and we meet primarily in the evenings. And this is, you know, many community members that are participating and we do provide stipends to honor the time of the individuals that are participating. Um, but it is a challenge to get 40 people to all be there at the mm -hmm. same time when they're balancing, you know, maybe their own athletic schedule if they're a young person or, you know, different things happening at, in, within the family. And so really, um, you know, us seeing that people are still coming is showing that value that they find in the group, which is wonderful. Um, but it is tricky to manage schedules and then adding in the work groups and the additional things that are happening. Um, it can be tricky. So we've had a lot of makeup sessions as a way mm -hmm. to, um, especially for those key meetings, so that everyone has a, the opportunity to contribute. And then we're sharing um, what we're learning from the different sessions back so that everybody gets to hear the perspectives of the other group. Um, you know, another challenge for us is that we have a lot of folks um, that are participating that don't have background in prevention. and. Um, and so really, um, this is new for many people. And so we've really taken the time to, um, you know, build those learning opportunities in at each session, as well as utilizing the experience of our other group members that are contributing and, and maybe do have that background. And so they're sharing pieces of information as part of the discussion. And um, that piece has been really helpful. But. Yeah, I think we can all say, uh -huh. yes, the technology uh -huh. thing has happened yes. as well. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. So it's like, knowing those videos really well is, uh -huh. a, is a good thing, just, just in case. So. Can I add one, one piece about that um, in terms of the meetings? Because one of the things that we did during our first five years, early in our first five years, um, our community board voted 
to alternate um, morning and evening meetings. So one, you know, the fourth Tuesday of the month, one month it would be at 10 a.m., the next one it would be at 5.30, and I think that worked well for a while. Um, but what we found in our new work is that, especially given the amount of stuff that we need people to weigh in on and vote on, is that um, it, it just wasn't working and it was creating kind of a lag time in between and kind of slowing down some of the decision making. Mm -hmm. So our um, site rep decided, well, let, let's speak to that and let's do a, a morning and an evening meeting all on the same day. So hats off to him for experimenting a little bit um, and you know putting his time out there like that. And I, th I think it worked for, what, two to three months or so, and then we decided that the evening meeting just wasn't as well participated. So, so we're now back to one meeting, and we had a full, I think, a, a full community board meeting this month, but I think it goes to a couple of things. One is um, that you can try innovative things, and two is that you listen to the board, you listen to mm -hmm. the participants, because the reason that we tried the alternating months early on was that we had folks who were participating for their job, and so they would come during the workday. They, they would take work time. Then we had residents that worked out of the neighborhood but wanted to participate because they felt a, a sense of responsibility to their community. And we wanted to try to honor both of those populations, and so we did that, and it worked well for a long time, but we just had to eventually shift based on the needs. Okay, thanks. Um, you talked a little bit about the CTC coaching and how important that is for your community with the CTC Plus model, and the internet uh, a little bit, mm -hmm. the difficulty with that. Um, but thinking ahead next to the focus on implementing the strategies, what are the supports you anticipate needing to successfully implement those strategies? So Amanda, where are you? Um, yeah, Amanda, and who else was talking about uh, uh, Sue Kearns? Um, you were both talking about implementation, and as we're anticipating moving there, uh, forecast for us uh, your ideas of what are the needs you'll have for uh, implementing the strategies. So, <laughs> I'm like, is anybody going to start? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we're going down the line or what do we want to do? Um, well, for one, we will have implementation work groups for each community so that it's not simply the University of Colorado doing all of the work. Um, you, you all know, and I, I know I'm preaching to the choir, that it, if there's going to be buy-in, then community members, stakeholders have got to be engaged in the process. So we'll establish in implementation work groups to kind of help hash out some of the decision making that needs to, to take place that will then go back to the full community board. I know on our end, since in terms of the staff, since the uh, community action plan training, um, we've had some a few conference calls to just do some fact finding so that we can prepare these implementation work groups with information that may very well help um, help them with their decision making. Uh, we are looking at also do we do some things jointly because our communities landed on different things as well as things that were the same. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at does it make sense for us to do efforts across both communities or should everything be separate? So those are just a few of the logistical things that we're trying to sort out as we prepare for more implementation. That was a really good answer. <laughs> I, I feel like we're thinking similarly, mm -hmm. um, you know, just really in terms of capacity building mm -hmm. for the board. Um, you know, since Colorado's plan is a, a, around um, doing environmental strategies, policies, you know, that type of thing that it's really feels new for folks in so many mm -hmm. ways. And so we really want to spend time building capacity of board members to be doing the things that are on the menu. And so, um, you know, as mentioned, the resource assessment piece does take a little while. Mm -hmm. And so we feel like that's a great time as we're meeting together as a, a community board to start working on that capacity building. At our last meeting, we were talking about what do, what do we feel like are the skills that we're lacking and things like, you know, storytelling and, um, you know, being able to share some of those skills. How do policies get created? Some folks wanted to hear more about that. And so I think um, those are things that we'll definitely want more support in and, and be working on um, locally. And I'm just also curious about, um, you know, Shelly, you talked about coordinating between the two communities, and mm -hmm. I'm even thinking, how are we coordinating statewide when we're mm -hmm. choosing similar mm -hmm. risk mm -hmm. factors or protective factors? What are the things that we could be doing 
um, together and how are we continuing to work um, between the facilitators and um, you know again with the state with Aaron etc and um, and just be able to implement things on a on a wider level learn from those mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. and I would agree with 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 both um, Shelley as well as Marcy one of the things that we're looking at um, is we're looking at just building more of our capacity around policy work so we've been going attending some trainings that are a little bit more specific to policy work and really just building up our knowledge level around that I think is a big part. We're lucky that we have an in-house evaluator, so we feel good, pretty good about figuring out that side of things, but it's really just making sure that we have a really great understanding of policy work. Yeah. I would second that. I think in addition to the, the policy and um, capacity building that needs to happen, one thing I've been trying to think of is when we get down to the strategies and have finalized those, they're very specific, and although you can have a lot of action items under each strategy, um, I think, I don't know if it's a logistical challenge, but a challenge nonetheless of how to make sure that people that potentially are not so directly aligned um, with those activities and strategies, how do we keep them on board with what we're doing and make sure that we find ways to incorporate their knowledge and experience um, to keep everybody moving forward with what the community board has ultimately decided um, to do with the community action plan. And I'll just add one more thing. Um, we have worked pretty hard to, around this idea that we're not going to do two, but we're going to do with. And so that speaks to the broad community, but it also speaks specifically to the young people. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of this work is in support of their development and um, you know, improving their lives. And so I know um, for both of our communities, it's important that one was, was much more articulate about um, saying we're not gonna do anything without our youth involvement. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the token youth, I think I heard somebody mention that earlier, but it's um, meaningful, meaningfully engaging them in, you know, we are choosing a media a communications campaign and they need to be involved in helping to design or, or weigh in on you know, the, how it's gonna be focused. So just making sure that the young people are still at the center mm -hmm. of the work that we are trying to do. Okay, so some important themes that emerge there. Implementation teams are really critical to succeed with these things. Fact finding, knowing what you're getting into and knowing how you're going to do it. Capacity building for the board and ensuring that the board has the knowledge base that they need to support this work in the community. And then that policy level knowledge, the importance of educating the board around policies is really important as well. Um, keeping, um, the coalition active, even though some of the coalition members not, might not have gotten the strategy or um, program that they were advocating for. So how do you keep them in the fold? And that's an important challenge um, and something that a lot of coalitions do struggle with. And I really think that, that opportunities for meaningful involvement for youth voice is a really critical issue. And that again goes back to those five simple strategies that Dave talked about earlier. And that's the first one, opportunities for meaningful involvement. Um, and with what you're talking about, you can see how the skills and recognition mm -hmm. follow from that so easily. So I think um, those are really important supports to have in place as you emerge into moving toward implementing your strategies and programs that you'll be selecting. It's really yeah. great to hear that. So the next question is one um, that uh, everyone has to have a different answer for. So this is kind of like the first come, first serve. And then someone else said, you have to get a, a, a second. So maybe you, ha you have to think of two things in case someone picks yours. So if you could share <laughs> just one piece of advice for a new CTC facilitator and coalition, what would it be? So first to the mic gets it. And then everyone else has to. <laughs> I'm think. not going to go first this I'm time. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, because so, you're. Yeah. You, you yeah, probably you, have I've the best person. used this advice <laughs> recently. <Yeah. laughs> um, I think something that's really helped me and something that was really instilled in us in our CTC training was that fidelity through the CTC Plus model is really moving your community board through those milestones and benchmarks. Um, and I think sometimes it could be a challenge to follow your facilitation guide and to hear what your community is saying. And I think that's where your coaching calls come into play and they're so helpful because you can kind of share what your community is saying and, and work with your coach to modify those facilitation styles. Mm -hmm. um, and I think someone mentioned earlier that 
it really is communities that care and not facilitators that care and mm -hmm. not putting all the work on yourself, but really making sure you're spreading that out and listening to your community. Um, it's been really helpful for me so far. So I counted three really important things there. Um, <laughs> fidelity to the milestones and benchmarks is really important to do and it gives you that guide. And you have to listen to the community. It's a community-driven process. And so making sure that you're using your coach to know how, how am I listening to, what do I make of all this, and how does it fit in within the system is important. Mm -hmm. And then finally, it is the communities that care, not the coordinator that care. All three of those are really critical, so thanks. Whoever's um, next to the so majority. I'll, I'll jump in. And I'm kind of inspired a little bit by Shelley's last answer. I will own that. But one of the things that I would also say is that, like you were saying, we need youth to be at the table and in any place so that we can put them. So we really want to look for really intentional spaces for youth to be involved. We won't be successful if we don't do that. So that feels like it's a no-brainer. You absolutely have to have youth at the table for this kind of work. I, I would say um, that one of the things that's been really helpful for our group and helpful for me personally has been really focusing the work around the values and the hopes that the community has and really that bigger vision. I think that's a huge anchor point that you can always go back to and really be building value into each step of the process. So yes, we do need to follow the milestones and benchmarks, but we want to see success in the community at each step along the way. So even the process of creating the vision statement in and of itself, we knew that was a, a big piece to do. But um, we had also heard through um, you know, our early process how much the community values public art and really thinking about the values of positive youth development and the social development strategy. And so um, we took that vision statement and got a group of young people together to create a mural um, that incorporated that. So we had that visual representation as well. Um, young people got to learn how to work together, learn about art for um, social change. And you know, it got to be something that we really all got to celebrate as a group. And so I think just continuing that each step along the way, if you're gathering data, how are you thinking about your values of getting youth involved in that process? You know, all of that um, throughout the process, I think, makes a big difference. And it just, you know, it really lets the community voice be what drives the process. Um, I think a piece of advice I would give for facilitators, I don't know if this will work for everybody, but it works for me, um, was to, from the onset, try as best as I could to really understand the full process of CTC. I know some people work better to piecemeal it and focus on each phase at a time. I'm not that person. I want to know everything right now. Poor Monica. I have lots of questions for her <laughs> all the time. Um, but I will say that CTC can seem like a very abstract process. And so when you're trying to talk to community members to recruit them for different work groups or one of your boards, um, the more that you can really understand the end point and the pieces, the key pieces along the way, the clearer it is for that person to understand if it's a good fit for them and how that they how they can fit into that um, process. So I think that's something that's worked well. Um, a piece of advice for coalition members, I think, would be to communicate often with the facilitator. Um, one of the I think common themes is that this needs to be community owned and operated and so I know that I turn to my board and work groups a lot to make those decisions and I offer options and I really rely on them to um, have the buy-in, do the work to make informed decisions and to act to make those decisions and so as a coalition member I think just being as prepared as you can um, to be able to make good decisions for the community. I would say um, two things, the two things come to mind. One is um, go slow to go fast, and this is a lesson that we've had to learn, or I've had to learn recently. Um, you've heard me say that we have an ambitious timeline, so I know that we spent a lot of time pushing the facilitators to push the community members and really just make sure that we, there was constant forward movement. That's, that's very important. But um, the movement has to be intentional and you have to really take some sometimes slower intentional steps in order to really um, speed up mm -hmm. at the back end. So I, you know, I mentioned we had to slow down so that the one community and their readiness really, and, and the, the concerns that they were bringing to the table um, were really honored. But um, in my mind, I'm like, well, 
that's fine, but you have a deadline still. Let's keep moving forward. <laughs> but it's about, <laughs> but I have to still slow down and just kind of honor the space that they were in. And the second thing is um, bring as many people and sectors to the table um, mm -hmm. that you can. Because especially key leaders, because those are the folks that you're going to lean on heavily when you move through and towards um, sustainability planning. And I know that we did that during our first round, and thanks to some of the key leaders that we had, we were able to make some, um, some pretty exciting steps around how to sustain the first five years in Montbello. And so I would just say, you never know um, in that meeting who you're talking to and how they might articulate that to their own stakeholders or their own board. And so the, the, as many people as you can, bring them to the table and help educate them on the value of the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's great advice. We heard from Jenna first some three important points, but then we heard how important it is for youth to be involved and at the table. We heard uh, to stay values, hope, and vision focused. That it's important to understand the whole picture of CTC and be able to communicate often with your coalition to go slow to go fast. I love that. I might just have that framed in my office. No, I didn't come up with that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, bring as many people to the table as you can and the importance of building that coalition because you don't know who's there and who you'll be talking to. Mm -hmm. All of those are really important things. Now I'm gonna ask um, for your final thing. This is lightning round uh, because we only have a few minutes because we want to have enough time for some questions. Just really a brief, one brief change, big or small, that you've seen in your community because of your CTC efforts. Really just a short quip, a quick quip. When you say quick, are you looking at me? No, <laughs> I'm not. Just a short, quick quip. I would say from the first five years, the sustainability work that we did intentionally over the course of probably a year and a half led to the establishment of a nonprofit. So we have the Steps to Success nonprofit focused solely on accessing funding for the first round program, individual and family level. And if you pair that with what we're trying to do now, the community level prevention strategies and policy level, then we truly have this comprehensive approach right there in Montbello. So that's exciting. That is cool. And that was quick. <laughs> I could say more. <laughs> um, so I would say this is um, maybe a little bit smaller, but I think important. So we did our community board orientation back in December of last year, and I was also a part of the IOG, which I think you all know what IOGs are. And we were at an IOG meeting a few months after that, and there were a few folks who were referencing some of the things that we learned in the community board orientation, and that was something that I thought was a really big success, that it was be going beyond just our efforts into other areas of our community. Um, so, I, yeah, it's, it's hard to pick, but I think, um, you know, we had some similar where you, f you feel that energy moving and other people eager for your data and wanting to ask questions, but I think one of the big successes of our group has been our community board themselves. Um, we've really created, um, they've really created an environment in which they're having those brave conversations, we're really listening um, to a variety of perspectives and really really debating these issues in new ways. And I think that that is going out to the other work that they're doing. And so we're just hearing people, the whispers of this, what's this shared risk and protective factor mm -hmm. stuff all about? And mm -hmm. so it's really looping back in good ways. And I think um, we're making smarter decisions as a board, but we're also um, making an impact on how other agencies and groups are doing their work. I think mine's kind of similar. Um, what I've noticed more conversations focusing on is the idea of risk and protective factors, but also the shared um, component of that. And mm -hmm. so using that as a nice way to link all of the great work that Pueblo has going on and really um, using that to our advantage to try to foster increased collaboration that, you know, if we can drill it down to these risk and protective factors, we will see, you know, improvements for all of the segments that we're all working in, whether we maybe see a direct connection on the onset or not, um, they are connected. And so having the research behind that has been very helpful. Um, so that and then also a primary prevention approach. And one of the things that Pueblo is, um, I don't know, known outside of Pueblo, but known within Pueblo, mm -hmm. is having a lot of um, multi-generational families. And so sometimes that can be a disadvantage if certain behaviors have been passed on 
from generation to generation, but taking that as an advantage and taking multi-generational approaches to um, our interventions. I feel mine was the shortest. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> we did want to leave time for some uh, conversation and questions or just comments, so if you'd like to just come up, and because this still is being live uh, streamed, be great to have your voice over the microphone for any comments or questions. And just say who you are since we're trying to make sure we're getting to know each other too. I'm, I'm Vic Myers, uh, Warfano County CTC. My question's for Marcy. How do you guys fund your stipends for your meetings? So it's, um, that's allowable within our CTC funds, so we just put that into our budget. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here I am again. I'm Tracy Jewett. And I actually have questions for both you, Shelly, and Jenny. Um, I'm interested in how it is then that you address that intersectionality with race and language mm -hmm. and all those things too, which mm -hmm. often are an additional barrier to folks showing up. I did some work in the Bell, and I remember what that was like, and mm -hmm. you know, Pueblo too is pretty close to Fountain, so again, having an understanding. Have you looked at and discussed those strategies within those cultures and that to be able to say, okay, what is gonna be the most effective way? And mm -hmm. two, are you able to really use what it is you get from your folks to incorporate in the CTC model rather than you know just operating in one specific way? Mm -hmm. No is my answer to your first question. Um, just being totally honest, we have not done a great job so far of making sure that our board is um, representative of what we know to be our community. Um, so that's been a challenge. Um, we also have struggled with just general community member and youth involvement. So those are things that we are going to continue to try to improve on. Um, the second part of that, I think that we have to the degree where it's been brought up, been able to be flexible with the process to fit our community. Mm -hmm. I will say, um, yes, we've talked about it. We have um, made some interesting steps around it in different ways. So our first five years, now keep in mind, um, you know, I work for the University of Colorado Boulder, mm -hmm. and we, our first five years was focused in Montbello, which is, um, about 60 some odd percent Hispanic, 20 some odd percent African American. So we did a lot of work around building trust because we, there was this feel of, oh, this, this institution in Boulder coming yeah. to tell all the black and brown people what to do. Yeah. And so we had to do a lot of work around building trust mm -hmm. and just be prepared for whatever conversations were gonna come our way. That community, when we started our first year, our first five years was on the tail end of a school turnaround effort that a lot of people did not feel good about. A lot of community people did not feel good about. So we had to absorb some of that in our own work and make sure that people, we always had community members at the table. They knew that the community board um, itself was the decision making body, that there was transparency. And so that kind of stuff came up. Now with, the, with that particular work, um, we never quite got to true representation of the community on the board, and I, and I speak specifically about the Hispanic community. Um, we did great in other areas, but not that. And so that's something that we've actually improved on during this next five years, thanks to our site rep's work. Um, and it's, it's, it's gonna be a constant, but there's also some trust issues that the mm -hmm. Hispanic community in Mount Bello has, Absolutely. given all the um, issues around immigration. Right. So it's something that we have to just be very careful about managing. I would also say that in our Park Hill work, um, there, there have been some frank conversations about race and culture and um, uh, police relations. Mm -hmm. And so there was, you know, there have been uh, community board meetings where there were tears, but our community resource officer was just frank about a lot of things. And so that board has done a lot to build trust within itself. And they said, before we vote on the risk and protective factors, we need to have some type of training around bias and what was the full name of the training? Implicit bias training. Mm. So they said that's what they awesome. wanted. And we had a local person who is, um, has done quite a bit of work in the area come in and just, it wasn't meant to be kind of this extensive, you know, multiple session, but it was, let's look, in, let's look at where you are, where your thinking is before 
you, you talked about language before we look at what these risk and protective yeah. factors mean directly here in Northeast Park Hill. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I can see that cultural piece and too, and mm -hmm. probably like you said, the, the multi-generational. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious because we're kind of squeezed in the middle and I'd love to know and understand and explore that. So thank you. Certainly. Would it be okay if I responded to your question as well? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, have, we have culture sorry, in Leadville too, it's okay. <laughs> Um, the end. No, that is okay. That is okay. We are we are more rural for sure. And we have some rurality too, so I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that is okay. That is okay. So I, um, our organization, Lake County Build a Generation, we really have a t kind of two main focuses. So one is improving health outcomes, which is where our work kind of comes in. But it's all the other part of it is in health equity. So we really are looking at some of those pieces that are specific to ethnicity in our community. Because for example, in our schools, 70% of our students are Hispanic. So that's definitely the dominant culture in our youth community. And so we've actually been looking through um, a couple different lenses when we're thinking about prevention work. And so some of the funding that we've received from the Office of Behavioral Health allows us to do specific parent engagement events. And so we've chosen to do those around um, illegal immigration status as well as DACA. So because those are the two biggest, um, in our community, those are the two biggest stressors right now is looking at that piece. And so we know that if someone is concerned about their immigration status, they're not really thinking right. about their pro-social opportunities. Right. And you know then what I mean? to the readiness piece, right? Yeah, absolutely. Readiness, right. It's like, mm -hmm. what, am I, what are we really ready to talk about? Yeah. Okay. I appreciate you, John. Oh, Thank you. No problem. If, if yeah, I could add you. as well. Yes, you talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> feed me, feed me. I want to hear what she has to say. Thank you. So, um, you know, we also um, really have a focus in Boulder County around health equity as well, and really, um, you know, from the beginning wanted to strive to have a community board that was really representative of the community, and so I, I feel like we, you know, we're not perfect, but we have a lot of diversity in all ways, mm -hmm. and um, our community board kicked off on January 26th. So if you oh. think about your calendar, January 20th, Inauguration Day. Oh, and so we were all a little raw that evening. Mm -hmm. And um, we really kicked off our conversation from the beginning in talking about equity and talking about that when we come to the table that we bring all of who we are, all of our different lenses, and that we really want to be open and hearing from each person based on that. And really thinking about, you know, as we're looking at, okay, well, maybe – parents aren't showing up for parenting classes. Well, why is that? Well, let's think about other things that are going on there. Um, and so really that those types of communications have been, you know, and discussions have been a key feature of our group throughout and really have been talking about. We watched the Tony Eiten TED Talk. If you haven't seen it, you should. Um, but just really thinking about how um, those social determinants of health really mm -hmm. impact people. And so, um, so I think that that's really a key component in, in, and we're not gonna be deciding on anything unless we really have okay. those deep conversations, which was a piece of what took us a while um, to decide on our priority factors too, because we really wanted to hash out, you know, why are, we, why are we thinking, what are the biases that are coming into play for us as well, so. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question too. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jesse Shea. I work with Denver Public Health CTC Coalition for LGBTQ plus youth. Um, and my question is, we were able to hire youth um, to actually be part of the coalition, which is huge. Like, we really wanted to make sure that we um, paid them for their time and didn't tokenize their opinions when taking that into account. We're having trouble kind of wrangling that situation um, as far as for folks who may not have ever had a job before or have had responsibilities of showing up at a specific place before, even if they are being um, paid for that time, I'm just wondering if you have any insight as to how to build the board up with youth and like have a consistent membership with folks showing up. I'm so tempted to answer, but we haven't gotten our youth to show up as well yet. <laughs> we actually... But I do have some thoughts, I do have some thoughts, and we actually just hired some CTC interns like two days ago, so that's why we haven't been able to assess that part yet. Can but I, I, oh please, Shelly, go ahead. Actually, so I'm not gonna answer the question, but my site rep just was saying, can I answer that? So, Heidi? Well, one of the things, um, one of the things that Get to the mic. Just so, so everybody can hear you. So the streaming folks can hear you. So one of the things that our board has decided to do, instead of having a work group of youth involvement, mm -hmm. they actually decided to have equitable space at the community board mm -hmm. for youth involvement. But those who identified that they wanted to do the youth involvement have decided to mentor those young people from a leadership capacity building perspective. 
So that would be skills. Right. Uh -huh. So we got the opportunity, <laughs> they got to have the skills, right? right? And so just asking them to come might not be enough. Having that mentor to bring them, that's great. Yeah. I like that. So we're actually in the process of structuring that right now. Um, so the director of the Boys and Girls Club has decided to do that for us because he's actually on the board. So he's going to train those that have decided they want to mentor on what mentor capacities look like from a leadership development standpoint, not a case management standpoint. Mm -hmm. Great. So we'll keep you. Did anyone else want to answer that question? I, I think um, for us, a, you know, a lot of the young people that have come to the table really were expressing a desire to have a leadership opportunity in some way. And so um, really incorporating them into the group and incorporating, you know, making the activities that are a little bit more fun for the group, um, hopefully, and really having some discussions on the side with them has been a piece of it. But I think, um, you know, making sure everybody feels valued is is a helpful way to get people to keep showing up and as soon you know when you're taking the feedback of those young people that are sharing and you're doing something with it right away i think that that is helpful too but i would say you know i so i come from the land of um of workforce um so i worked at a workforce center before and there may even be some trainings um that are more on the workforce sort of realm that might be helpful um to showing you know those young people, some of those skills a little bit more concretely that would be useful, but then also, you know, I think sometimes young people have a hard time being in a setting with other adults, um, having their feedback appreciated, and so um, how thinking about um, building the capacity of the adults to step back and listen, and how do they respond to the young people's voices as well is also helpful. So we did spend, we had some conversations about that, but um, if you feel like maybe that's something coming up for folks also, that might be a thought. Oh, and one other thing really quick, I think it's great if you don't have a youth by themselves. So having them have this experience with another youth, then it's like a collective experience and they're gonna bring each other back. They're gonna come back for each other. Yeah. Ours started all sitting at the same table um, the first few sessions, and now they're spreading out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I add something? Yes. Like to, um, we took ours a step farther at, in um, Antonio Ray County, and um, we have rather a homogenous society, but um, we, we have a CTC community board made up of about uh, close to 40 people and nine of those people are youth. And we took ours farther in, <laughs> this kind of just was organic. In our first community board meeting, um, we had several youth there and they started questioning, are you really gonna listen to us? Mm -hmm. And so our mayor said to the person that was saying that, the young person that was saying that, well, yes we will and how are we, how about you run for the chairman? So during that meeting, our community board elected all the youth as chairperson, uh, three co-chairpersons and the recorder of the community board. So it, then it has morphed into a coaching um, situation for leadership skills because they're high school students and they didn't, you know, they haven't really had a lot of experience um, chairing meetings <laughs> with a lot of adults around specific subjects and uh, progress that we have to do. So we have been, I have been, uh, mostly me, but other people too have been mentoring them in how to run the meetings, how to set the agenda, how to move the conversation along, and how to address everything that's, that's there like you do. So, we just said, yeah, you want to have a voice? It's yours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is really um, exciting for me to hear about the social development model at work with opportunities for meaningful involvement that you heard, like even into leadership roles. But you can't just give the opportunity without making sure you have the skills mm -hmm. and the recognition that comes from that. So all three of those really important components. So thank you for that great question and how that really feeds us. I really, um, this was really an amazing hour for me. 
And I just feel honored to have heard about the fact that we have to remember that it takes time to do this work, that um, we need to respect the communities and everyone in it, uh, and use the strong data packages that we have to make those decisions in our communities that make sure that we're including youth voice at every step of the way. And that we make sure that to remember that the process really does matter in how we do this work uh, from the intersectionality issues that emerge in all of our communities. And that although it's a lot of work, it's really meaningful and important work. And so Shelley and John and Jenna and Marcy and Jenny, thank you very much for everything you shared with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you.